So as Mike mentioned, I'm the Penn State tree fruit pathologist starting March 1st. And this collaboration between University of Maryland and Penn State, how will it will unfold is really up to me. So, and I'm very excited by that prospect. And I most likely you'll see me at these, these winter meetings and also at the twilight meetings. But as far as really pressing problems, I encourage you to maintain contact with your extension specialist and then they'll probably get in touch with me until I kind of figure out my way with regards to this. But this is a very exciting uh, partnership. Uh, just to kind of introduce, further introduce myself to give some background about me and my history. So I'm local. I grew up in northern Delaware and I went to the University of Delaware. I majored in entomology and plant pathology. Uh, but while I was at Delaware, I spent three years interning at DuPont, well, which is now called Pioneer, in their insect uh, control group, looking for alternatives to control insects. I shifted gears and went to Cornell for my graduate work, and I worked on insect-transmitted plant viruses, uh, particularly uh, aphid-transmitted plant viruses. My lab at Cornell had a partnership with, or a collaboration at Penn State, and I continued some postdoctoral work in additional insect transmitted viruses, but focusing more on the aphid itself. Uh, in 2010, I was feeling restless and wanted to broaden my plant pathology background, so I, oh, let me back up a bit. I got into extension while I was at Penn State, and I participated in the Master Gardener program, and I'm still a Master Gardener. I was so passionate about Master Gardeners that even from 200 miles away, I've been able to maintain my certification. So I was feeling restless, wanted to broaden my plant pathology background, so I decided to pursue another postdoc in post-harvest pathology of poem fruits. And this took me to the USDA ARS in Beltsville, uh, initially working for Bill Conway, and now I'm working for Wayne Jurek as his postdoc. Part of our work takes us to apple country, both in Maryland and in Pennsylvania. And it's been during this experience that I've realized I've seen the light, and my passion is tree fruit and I absolutely love working on tree fruit. So when this Penn State position came along, it, I felt it was my calling. So I'm, I'm very, very excited to be able to merge my interest in extension, but also my passion for tree fruit and tree fruit research into this position. One of the big things with tree fruit I know is the whole thing with resistance management. With plant viruses, there are no virucides out there. So this was a, a new ball game for me when I started a few years ago. So as far as learning about fungicide and fungicide resistance management. And as a result, how I've formulated my talk today, I want to lay a foundation of information and knowledge in order to emphasize the ways to manage resistance. This may be a review for a lot of you, but I, I want all of us to be on the same page. So the first topic we're going to talk about is fungicide 101. You hear a lot of terms out there. I want to make sure that everyone understands uh, what certain key terms are with uh, fungicides. Also, what is resistance? The definition of resistance. How do we classify resistance? And then finally, we'll talk about ways to manage resistance. So the fungicide 101, the basics, protectants versus penetrance, mode of action. You may also hear it referred to as MOA, single site versus multi-site. Also, we're going to spend some time talking about the Fungicide <coughs> Resistance Action <coughs> Committee, or FRAC, and the FRAC codes. Also, um, knowing the fungicides, again, this area, a lot of terms are thrown out. It can get confusing, I know, because it was a bit of a learning curve for me. But as far as talking about the fungicide, the group, the group codes, the families, the common names, and trade names. So as far as everyone kind of getting on the same page with regards to all that terminology. Okay, so protectants versus penetrants. Protectants. These are the contact fungicides. They just stay right on top of the plant, on top of the leaf. There is no movement into the plant with contact fungicides. And as a result, for control, these need to be applied prior to the spores landing on the plants. With these fungicides, since there's no movement into the plant, they need to be reapplied. They aren't rain fast, so they'll get washed off. And also, anytime you have new growth, they need to be reapplied. 
So you the examples, which many of you are familiar with, we're talking about the, the EBDCs, the captan, culprit, copper, sulfurs. Now, in contrast, the penetrants, which are also referred to as the systemics, these are absorbed into the plants following rain um, application. And these are rain fast as a result. And let me just emphasize with this part here is that all systemics, these aren't created equally. They all don't behave the same way. But the, mode, the, the basic mode of them being absorbed to a degree in the plant is there. That's, how that, that's why they're referred to as penetrants or systemics. You can have less thorough coverage of the fungicide in order for it to be effective because they're moving into the plant. These are also referred to as protectants or curative. And I have curative in quotes because they technically don't cure the, fun the fungus problem. What it's doing is it's inhibiting or slowing the growth of the fungus. So if you have a lesion on your leaf, it won't disappear. And these can be applied even unlike the protectants where it has to be applied before the infection, these can be applied during the early stages of infection. And some of the examples are Vanguard, Flint, Pristine, um, some of those different fungicides. Okay, the fungicide um, as far as mode of action or MOAs. So when we're talking about how fungicides affect the fungus, we're talking about how the fungicides target certain processes in the fungus in order to shut the fungus down, or essentially how the fungicide poisons the fungus. So the end result is when it attacks these certain processes, which are vital for the fungus survival, they die. We're talking about site-specific fungicides. We're talking about the systemics or penetrants. And these fungicides are attacking just one process out of all the processes that occur within the fungus. With, with regards to interfering with the nucleic acid synthesis or signaling, division, cell division, sterile synthesis, or respiration. Some of these key, very important processes in the fungus. In contrast, multi-site fungicides, these protectants, what these do is these attack several different sites simultaneously, hence multi-site. Okay, Fungicide Resistance Action Committee, and that is the website, and I encourage people to go visit it and, and peruse it to understand it, because this will become your best friend with regards to FRAC and the FRAC codes. So what FRAC does, it's made up of a bunch of individuals from, all the, from various different chemical companies, and what they do is they work to prolong the effectiveness of the fungicides, which are liable to encounter resistance. And not only fungicides, but also antibiotics. The antibiotics are registered under the FRAC code as well. well we're oh, I had a book here, FRAC book. I didn't, I didn't oh. Sorry. oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> we're talking about FRAC codes. This makes your life a whole lot easier when it comes to talking about managing fun um, the fungicide resistance, is that they're listed on the label of your fungicide. And you'll see they'll have group numbers and whether it's a fungicide, and also um, IRAC, the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee, and also the herbicide as well. They have similar codes as well. When we're talking about changing up fungicides, many times you're telling, well, change the active ingredient, but many times you'll have different active ingredients and they're in the same group. And I just want to mention that that CDMS um, website is very good if you're looking, if you're curious as far as what the FRAC label is, you can go in, you can find the specimen label and it'll pop up and it's like right underneath the fungicide name. You'll see the FRAC code. Sometimes you may have the random fungicide label that doesn't have the FRAC code. Well, you would want to go into the booklet that comes with your fungicide or go online to that website and just look under the resistance management portion and it'll tell you what group it's in. Okay, so knowing the fungicides included in your folder, I put in a table of a bunch of fungicides and their various affiliations with each other. Your, that spray guide does it as well, that I, I, I just noticed as well. But the reason um, why I did this, or, or first of all, let me back up. How I compiled this is I used Penn State's 2013 spray sheet. 
And so, and I combined the apples, the peaches, the pears, and the cherries for this to, as far as combining all of them. And the purpose of this is to see that you've got a lot of different names, and particularly in certain groups, like the DMIs. You have a lot of different names that are affiliated with the DMIs. And what I want to emphasize with your table here is the different major fungicide families or classes that you'll encounter. For, first of all, you have your benzimidazoles. These are the first fungicides that came about way back when, and that's why they are given the frac code of one. Frac codes are labeled by when they came about. DMIs, so the frac has now, call, now call these SBIs. So if you ever hear SBI, they're talking about DMIs, and SBI stands for sterile biosynthesis inhibitor. You have your carboxamides or SDHIs, your APs, your aniloperimidines, strobilurin or QOIs, and your EBDCs. You've got your common names. So many times with some of your fungicides, you have, there's not a common uh, portion of the name. You'll have different names. Because uh, like for DMIs, you may have azole will be at the end of it. Or strobilurins, you have the, the like paraclostrobin, you'll have strobin at the name of it. But they're not, there are some QOIs that don't have stro, um, strobin at the end of it. One thing I want to emphasize is that products with the same frac number, they behave similarly. So when you're hearing about cross resistance, that means that the DMIs, you may hear of cross resistance with DMIs, even though they're different names and they may have different active ingredients, they have the same frac number. They're going to be doing the same thing. Now, I just want to point out that frac codes 7 and 11, the QOIs and the SDHIs, they do have the similar mode of action of respiration, but they're different targets in respiration. So don't worry about the mode of action. Just pay attention to the frac number. For your multi-site fungicides, you may see like M1, 2, 3, etc. They all behave differently. Just focus on the M part, the multi-site. So the multi-site, they're going to behave differently. Products with the different frac, uh, frac numbers, they're going to act differently. Okay, what is resistance? We're going to get the definition of it. Frac codes and risk and fungicides and risk. And I put this game of risk because sometimes you wonder if there is this conspiracy of the fungi, fungi out there that for global domination, particularly with resistance. <laughs> so what is resistance? Resistance is a change in sensitivity of a pest population to a particular pesticide. So with resistance, we're talking about the reduced efficacy of fungicides. Well, how does this resistance develop? Well, you can have, well, first of all, let me just preface by saying, Fungi pathogens, they're always smarter than us. <laughs> they'll always figure out a way to get around something. So these fungi, they'll have genetic mutations at low frequencies. But at the same time, you may have populations in the field that are already resistant, that have never seen the fungicides or the different chemicals. That happens. Those populations exist out there. Well, how does this resistance develop? We're talking about selection. You may hear the word selection. What we're talking about is the favoring of resistant populations. So it's using the same fungicide over and over and you, with a single, the same single mode of action, so you are selecting for those resistant populations. If you hear about selection pressure, and this will be, I'll further follow up on this with regards to the control measures, we're talking about the intensity of that selection, the intensity of favoring those resistant individuals. And that selection is exerted by the fungicide. Okay, so as far as what FRAC has done to uh, assign risk levels to the various fungicides, and they did this based on the mode of action, and some mode of actions are more susceptible to resistance than others. And the resistance development, so it depends on whether fungicide affects a single metabolic site or multiple sites within the fungus. So remember when we're talking about single site versus multiple sites mode of action. Single gene mutation, that's all it takes for, an ind for a fungus to become resistant. And as a result, you could have 
a population of fungi that become uh, that are highly sensitive or mostly sensitive to the fungicide. side. You have a couple fungi that have this genetic mutation where they're resistant. In one or two applications, you could be favoring that resistant population. We're talking about at risk and high. You hear that that's the same thing, high risk or at risk. We're talking about products that have the single site mode of action. And these disease resistant populations, they have been discovered. Medium, these are also still single site products with single site actions, but there may be a mutation at more than one product or more than one target site. And this is resistant if formation is less frequent. You don't see it as often, but it does occur. And finally, with the low risk, these are very rare or undocumented occurrence of resistance. So at risk high, medium risk or low. So let's take a look back at the fungicide table. So if you different fungicide groups with all the different chemicals. So we have the benzimidazoles. These are ranked very high. The reason is, is because the target site is a one particular gene, which is the beta tubulin gene, which is required for cell division. And it's been documented that it's mutations in this specific gene that alters the susceptibility of the fungus um, to be sensitive to the fungicide. For and another, the QOIs, the strobularins, they're also high too because, it, again, it's, it's been nailed down to one gene that is affected. You get a mutation in that gene and boom, your fungicide becomes infected. With the DMIs, this is medium risk because it hasn't been nailed down to one particular site. There are various sites that have been mutated that confer resistance. And then with the low, because you have these multiple sites being affected simultaneously, it takes, a very, it takes a very huge thing for it to overcome all those sites, and we have not seen that occur. Okay. Now we're on to the part where I'm sure all of you want to, uh, to know and be anxious to hear. We're talking about the best ways to manage uh, fungicide resistance. We're talking about how to proactively avoid fungicide resistance. The whole thing with managing fungicide resistance is you really can't prevent it from happening, or you can't really stop it from occurring. What you can do is slow down the process. And so what we're going to be doing is focusing on cultural control and chemical control. And the purpose of managing fungicide resistance is having a very diverse control measures in order to manage resistance. For cultural control, we're talking about good plant health practices. You want to reduce the reliance on, on fungicides. And how do you do this? Well, you want to plant disease-resistant varieties because susceptible varieties, pathogens really like. They can re reproduce very, very well on susceptible varieties. If you have varieties that are more resistant, slower. Slower growth means less inoculum in the field. Proper pruning, getting rid of some of the diseased, uh, the diseased portions that you, uh, of the, the trees, the twigs, and if the bark, if you can manage it. Minimizing stress, water stress, uh, proper nutrition. And finally, sanitation. With sanitation, oops, let me back up here. With sanitation, the purpose of sanitation is reducing pathogen populations. You want to create a less favorable environment for those pathogens to grow and be happy. And because this is so important with sanitation, I'm going to spend a slide talking about it. We're talking about sanitation. We're talking about free from pathogens. So the development of the disease, this is dependent upon the amount of initial, initial inoculum available. So the disease you see in the spring, this is stuff that is overwintered. And pathogens like to overwinter on their host tissue. And they'll do that in the field. If you keep it out there, it'll stay out there over winter and it'll be ready for the coming year. You want to remove and destroy the infected tissue uh, that pathogens overwinter on. These are mummies for brown rot. This is a very important source of inoculum for the next year. The leaves that fall on the ground or the fruit 
that fall on the ground that have lesions on them. We're talking about scab or other rots. This is a source of inoculum for the next year. And to further emphasize this, you don't like being around sick people because <laughs> they spread germs. You're healthy, you don't want to get sick. Your trees don't want to be around infected tissue in order for them to become infected in the same, um, in the coming year. How do you get rid of this stuff? Well, one, you can remove it, pruning out the dead or decayed areas. Uh, Applying urea to the fallen leaves. I'm sure I'm not sure if how many folks do this. You can either do the fall, the spring, and what this does is the urea it initiates the microbial breakdown, so it gets rid of that tissue that the pathogen needs to survive on. And I just made a note that when you're applying urea, you want to adjust your nitrogen according, accordingly, uh, your nitrogen fertilizer accordingly. Another way to get rid of this leaf litter is using a flail mower. This chops it up and helps further the breakdown. Also controlling your weeds. This is another source where your pathogens can hang out on. Okay, as far as chemical control goes, we're talk I'm going to talk about dormant copper sprays, applying fungicides only when absolutely necessary. So talking about tanks mixing and using the frat codes. The importance of following the fungicide label information, and then finally giving you an example of, of how to control brown rot late in the season. Say, so dormant copper sprays, again, emphasizing that the development of disease uh, is dependent on the amount of initial inoculum available. Uh, Henry Googie, my predecessor at Penn State, he and his grad student, Emily Prufer, had done this work looking at uh, scab-resistant isolates and also looking at orchard management strategies and the use of copper. So the goal of the dormant copper sprays is that you want to destroy as much of that initial inoculum early in the spring. So your initial inoculum is composed of the populations that survived the previous year. So the, whatever didn't get hit with your spray programs last year, it's still hanging out in your field. What the copper does is it's destroying that overwintered inoculum. Oh, I'm sorry. You say, <coughs> suggest applying a orchard floor spray under the tree that grows in the fall well, of copper to help disable these inoculum? That's a good question. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I would probably, it would probably help. Uh, I have to look further as far as to see what, because uh, Henry had written this whole thing uh, in 2011 about dormant copper sprays. I can't recall, but if you give me your information, I could probably find the information out for you specifically. Is there any other questions about that? Um, what is the best timing of doing that copper spray? Or, I mean, you spray copper for well, other reasons, but for... Well, this is we're talking the dorm. This is before you even have I, before the initial. Is it? Um, I think silver tip is the first one. So it's before that. So it's it's it'd be probably right around now or in early March. I believe that's when they were looking at the dormant copper sprays, and it was more. I believe it was more effective in the spring. You're basically talking apples right now. Yes, yes. This is app. This is with apples. But um, let me get a little further here as far as the data that he presented. They looked at no copper versus copper, and so this first one is talking about the susceptibility of the DMIs in particular to, uh, I believe this was apple scab that they had worked on. And as you can see, when you use copper, you, the fungi that are out there are more susceptible to the DMIs. And also when they used uh, dormant copper, uh, there was fewer percentage of, of the resistance isolates present. This can be used for scab, fire blight, bacterial spot, and peach leaf curl. So this was something that um, Peter, I'm sorry, Henry had emphasized in this article that he written for Fruit Times uh, in 2011. And if anyone wants that, give me your information and I can forward that article to you because he goes into uh, more depth about the use of dormant copper sprays. But the, the take home message here is that it is successful. It does knock back those populations, particularly the resistant populations of fungi. So was that, did I hit your answer, your question, as far as when to spray? Back? Okay. Okay. As far as uh, 
further talking about chemical control, tank mixing your fungicides. You want to, the goal of this, when we're talking about mixing fungicides, you want to combine your fungicides with the high risk ones, the, the site specific, with the low risk multi-site. So if you look in, in the, the spray guide bulletin here, many times the suggestions, it'll be either combining with Captan or Mancozeb. So what, it, what happens here when you're mixing is that when you have this combination of chemicals, whatever doesn't kill with one chemical, it'll be cleaned up with another chemical. So it's you're lowering the chances of having some of those resistant populations existing out there. You can either use the tank mix or some of these premixes out there as well, which I believe also can be combined with some of your uh, low risk or multi site uh, fungicides. So, these premixes, we're talking about adamant or pristine, the different Luna formulations. And I just want to emphasize about reading the labels to determine the fungicide um, compatibility. When we're talking about alternating fungicides with different modes of action, we're not talking about just using different products with different names. The phrase I want you to remember is spraying by the numbers. You may hear rotate, rotate, rotate. Remember, spray by the numbers. When we're talking about spray by the numbers, we're talking about spraying by the different frac codes. So using the different frac codes to your advantage. When you Spray with your fungicides, it's a good idea to monitor your orchard to see how well those fungicides are working. And so if there is some failure, you can, you're seeing it right away and hopefully you can kind of manipulate the chemistries to prevent it from getting uh, ahead of you. Okay. Following the fungicide label information, this is very important. You want to be using at the recommended dose with the adequate coverage. You want, don't want to be cutting quarters. When you're cutting corners uh, or using sublethal doses, you're allowing those populations that are resistant to take hold. The limits, when they're talking about limits for different fungicides as far as not using you know, the certain class so many times a season, we're talking for the whole class. So, for instance, QOIs, they say four times a season. That means not just four times for that chemical, it's four times for the entire class of fungicides. So, for, for, for instance, for the pristine with palm fruit, they emphasize about no more than two sequential applications. Uh, and then for the stone fruits, for both palm and stone fruits, it emphasizes about how not using group seven or 11 fungicides per season, not using any more than what's recommended. And that's something to keep in mind with some of these premixes. Okay. So to emphasize uh, the spraying by numbers, I went to the Hershey meeting at the end of January and Norm Lancet at Rutgers, he gave a talk about controlling late season fruit rots on, uh, for peaches. And he gave an example about controlling late season brown rot. So what he recommended was a three spray uh, regime where you're spraying at 18, nine and one day pre-harvest. And what he found was that that final spray could be before or after the first picking. And what this, as far as control of disease, it was greater than 95% control for heavy disease. And this was the regime he recommended. At 18 days, using a QOI, such as GEM, and that's fungicide frat group 11. And Fontellus at nine days, that's a seven. Indar, at, and that's a three. So as you can see, we've got three different modes of action here, three different chemicals with three different numbers. So this is by spraying by the numbers and emphasizing the alternating of the different chemicals. There was a question in the audience that someone asked, well, can I use pristine for one of those sprays? He says, yeah, sure, that's no problem. However, you have to remember, pristine is a seven and 11. If you're gonna be using pristine, you gotta be mindful about using these, or not using these other two chemicals because they are 11 and a seven. Now you have fungicide failure. First thing many people think about is resistance to blame. Well, 
Fungicide failures, they may not be due to resistance. And I included a checklist for, in addition to the fungicide table for everyone. So in the event, if you have a fungicide failure, you can go through some different uh, things to think about with regards to uh, different things that could be contributing to your fungicide failure. The first thing you want to do is eliminate other possible causes. So the first thing is the fungicide application. Did you have an inadequate rate? Was there poor spray, spray coverage? And um, Dave had mentioned about the, how the different nozzles are, making sure that your nozzles are adjusted particularly so you're getting adequate coverage. The environmental and plant growth conditions. Was it excessively wet or dry? Was the plant stressed, such as uh, uh, you know, hot or dry? I'm sorry, excess the soil, was the soil wet or dry? Was it stressed out, the conditions? Again, such as hot or dry. Uh, did, was it raining a lot and the fungicides were washing off? This was the case, I believe, back in 2011 when scab was so prominent was that it was just all over the place. People were saying, ah, fungicide resistance, but it was raining all the time, so nothing could stay on the trees. And again, is, is there new plant growth? Is that protected? Is it not protected? The fungi characteristics, this is an important one. Have you correctly identified the fungi that's infecting your trees? Did you use the appropriate fungicide? Do you have really high fungal populations? And also, were there additional infections that occurred where the fungi or the fungicide treatment was no longer effective? And then other things to ask yourself are, have you been following uh, a resistance management program? Meaning, did you, does this field have a history of extensive at-risk or the high-risk fungicide usage? Or we're using a lot of DMIs constantly. And also, were you using cultural control measures? So these are all things to think about before you jump on, it is my fungicide uh, not working due to resistance. So it's just, just keeping in mind those different, uh, 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 different causes. But then when in doubt, you contact your local extension specialist and they could help you as well, kind of figuring out where the root of your problem is. So finally, the take home messages that I want you to remember when you leave today, pay attention to the frac codes on those fungicide labels. Remember, site-specific, these are systemic, these have a resist for resistance. The multi-site, the protectants, they have a lower risk for resistance. Being mindful of fungicide resistant management, spray by the numbers, use those frac codes. With the fungicides, mixing and dormant sprays, and also keeping your orchards healthy and clean, and then uh, when, if you have a fungicide failure, you want to eliminate those other causes first. Have you been following a resistance management program? And again, contact your local extension specialist. And just to let you know, uh, I don't have business cards yet, so <laughs> I made sure to put my information on the bottom of that second sheet for you. So you do have a way of contacting me. And also, just as a, an aside, I plan on really revamping the disease management portion on Penn State's website. I'm not very happy with the way it is. And so uh, I want to improve it and, and make it more accessible with regards to, there's a lot of information on there, but it's hard to find in certain places. And also, as far as working with the University of Maryland as well, to get information readily to you and um, yeah, and things will evolve as they evolve, but I'm very excited to be able to be here with you guys. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. On the labels, mm -hmm. you have like active ingredients. Mm -hmm. It tells you what it is. Mm -hmm. What about the inert ingredients? They never say what it is. It just says... Right. Well, this, this is what I've known by working with both of them in the lab is the inert ingredients typically, they make the fungicide work better. And so the active ingredient is your primary, the active ingredient is <coughs> the target for killing the fungus. And the inert ingredients, 
they don't really ha play a role with resistance, it's the active ingredient because that's what's doing the killing. So you don't have to worry about the inert ingredients. Does that answer your question? Okay. Here are the questions for uh, Karen.